thanks very much for, for coming on and having a chat with us today. Uh, we really appreciate the time. Um, so I appreciate you coming thanks on. Thanks for having show. me. No, no, it's, uh, I'm looking forward to actually having a chat with you. I've got quite a few things I want to ask you. Um, sure. I guess, I guess, first of all, it's, how, how has life been for you recently? Um, how is life over over in the states at the moment? I mean, it's it's okay. Um, I'm still trying to live, you know, life to the fullest. Still, you know, of course, there's regulations and rules that everyone's got to follow outside of the house. And and right now, we just went into, I think, effective yesterday. We went into a curfew last night, which was about six o'clock. You weren't allowed to be outside, you know, doing all that stuff. Um, you know, police are enforcing that pretty hard over here. So, um, yeah, it's, it's getting a little rough. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, because obviously we've got, um, got the COVID-19 situation that's been ongoing for exactly. a little while. But then obviously you've got the other side of that. Um, we, we, the death out in America, obviously a very high, highly publicized one, again, involving yeah. law, law enforcement. Um, so it seems like... Yeah, there's a lot of stuff happening as well with both things going on. Is that just added again on top of COVID to everything that's going on? I think that, that I, I see, I don't really know because I'm not out there on the streets, you know, mm. protesting and all that stuff. And, and as much as I feel for, you know, the death of Mr. Floyd, um, I'm not out there. I just don't want to risk me getting sick or anything like that. Um, so I'm trying not to be around too many people still. Um, but I mean, if you look at the news, the news is pretty much on worldwide. Um, it, it's a little crazy. I mean, the fact that people are protesting so close to each other, I get the whole protest and that I am 100% with all that, but you know, to be that close during a, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, you know, then you're going to go out and protest with a bunch of people. It's just, you know, I just don't think it's that safe, but yeah, no, I thought, because even we out here in Scotland, there's now, uh, from what I gather, there's going to be protests um, yeah, as yeah. well in relation to that. So that on top of COVID, you just wonder, <laughs> it's, it's looking a bit bleak at the moment. So, <laughs> but, I mean, um, you know, yeah, I just think, I just think people are so focused on, you know, the death of George Floyd that, they just kind of forgot about COVID-19, you know, everyone's trying to wear masks, but there are a lot of people that aren't, you know, and, and it's still around and it's hasn't fully gone away. And, you know, I just think that it could be a danger to some people still. So I just say, yeah. be smart. That's what, you yeah. know, do what you want, but be smart. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of um, social distancing, training <clears throat> and stuff like that, how, how have you been keeping yourself fit during this uh, um, I've been doing a lot of like at home training. So I have mats here at home. Uh, I have weights here at home. Um, I do see my strength and conditioning coach comes to see me. Um, and, uh, one of my stand up coaches comes to see me, but other than that, I have pretty much cut everybody off. Plus my father, uh, lives in the same house as me. So there's no, no reason for me to bring in another jujitsu coach. So. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, if you're going to be locked down, um, do you, your father's a pretty good guy to be locked down. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you've you've kind of won the lottery a wee bit there, right? Yeah, I would I would say I'm pretty pretty set for a little while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, well, I know a few fighters who'll be jealous. I know a few fighters who're teaching their girlfriends how to hold pads and stuff like that. And it's it's maybe not the best training, but it's it's something at least I, I something, guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah it that, keeps me fit. It definitely keeps me going. Um, you know, my sister's here a lot too. And she, you know, she, before this whole COVID thing started, she was heavy into track and field. So I run a lot with her and, you know, it's, so it's good. My family pushes me pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess that's it. I mean, it's the main thing is you're, you're getting the work in and, and, and try exactly. to progress yourself as a martial artist. Um, exactly. But you, you had just, you'd started getting yourself in a good run with Bellator there. You'd managed to put a couple of wins together. I know you were scheduled to fight in January. That fight obviously yeah. didn't happen. We've seen other promotion, promotions, i.e. the UFC. They've started getting fights back. Has there been any word to you from Bellator? Is there, have you got any inkling um, as to when they might start uh, booking fights again? As of right now, I don't know. I'm not scheduled to fight uh, as of right now. No. So no, Scott Cole has not got any secret islands or anything like that. He's going to be hooking you up with <laughs> no, nothing like that. As far as I know, no. <laughs> but you know, I'm just a fighter. I don't actually work like for the show, so I wouldn't know any about that. No, absolutely. Um, 
So, I wanted to sort of take you back a wee bit to before you before you made your uh, MMA debut. I've seen you speaking in the past before. Obviously, you'd you spoke to your father. You wanted to you wanted to start fighting MMA. How long a process was that for you when you first approached your father with the idea that you wanted to do it? Till the point he actually let you, he just said to you, "Right, that's you. You're ready to ready to go." Um, to be honest, I I grew up um, playing soccer. A lot of people know that. Um, didn't really have the thought of going into MMA right away. Uh, definitely was looking at the option of going to college and, you know, playing soccer in college and studying and getting a degree. And then um, I think my senior year of high school, I pretty much was like, look, I love soccer a lot, but my family has been doing this for a very long time. (laughs) So, you know, somebody's got to step in the cage. Somebody's got to, you know, pick back up, you know, where where the Gracies had left off, you know, a generation ago. So... Um, you know, right now there's four or five Gracie's fighting, maybe six Gracie's fighting currently, um, throughout Bellator and the UFC. So, you know, I would say my gener- generation's coming back around. Yeah, perfect. And just you've obviously seen there, uh, that's that's Callum joined us. And uh, Callum, yeah. thanks, thanks How for joining us. guys, you all right? <laughs> okay. What's up? What's um, up, man? I'll bring you in in a, a few moments, Callum. So, ju- just what you were saying there about, um, obviously. You focused on on soccer. What what was there a specific thing then that just made you? Was it <clears> purely <throat> about that about the legacy for your family that made you want to move into MMA? Well, um, I would say it was mostly legacy. I would say it was definitely had a lot to do with um, you know me towards my senior year of high school training a lot more. Um, I could slowly see myself coming away from soccer, which which I did love to play. I just at that time, I was more enjoying MMA or jiu-jitsu at the time. You know, I wasn't really into MMA my senior year. Um, but I just, I think I just started enjoying the whole aspect of being on the mat, uh, like, a lot more the older I got. I would respect it a lot more, and I would respect, like, where my family came from and what they were doing and what they have done. Um, and I think it just one day just kind of clicked, and I, you know, I was like, hey, Dad, when I get your blessing, I would love to step in the cage. You know, I, I think I'm, I'm not going to go to college. Um, and I think I'm just going to fight. And, and, you know, as soon as you think I'm ready, I would love to step in the cage. So. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big thing to do though, isn't it? It's, I mean, take, like say that not go to college and just, you're almost putting all, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. So it's, did you feel there was any extra pressure on you to? Um, I wouldn't say there was extra pressure. I would say that there definitely was a lot to learn in a short amount of time because I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't fully into the whole MMA society. I wasn't training kickboxing, Muay Thai, you know, boxing, wrestling. I was solely a jiu-jitsu, you know, person. So um, I would say there was definitely a lot to learn in a short amount of time. And I guess as well, Callum, you'll be able to speak on this. It's not just learning all the individual skills, it's finding a way to put them together that suits you, that's going to be transferable into the cage. It was, how, yeah. how was that process for you, trying to get everything working together? Well, I think that that growing up with a lot of Gracie influences, everyone has their own um, style. Everyone likes... At the end of the day, we all love jiu-jitsu the most. But we do each have our own takedowns, you know, set of strikes that we like to throw. Um, And I think for a while, it was me just on top of learning everything that was all new to me. It was kind of figuring out what worked for me and what didn't. There were some things that would work for my father that wouldn't work for me. Or there were some things that would, you know, uh, work for me that just my father just wasn't really preferable into. And I think uh, that was kind of the biggest the biggest struggle the biggest hardest like or the hardest part for us as it like a whole team in general was to kind of figure out what i liked what i didn't like um and now to implement all those things and get better at them yeah and Callum, i'm sure you'll be able to speak to that as well because you you started you, you had a striking background but you've obviously been fell in love with jiu-jitsu and you competed in bellator it was dublin you fought on and got the victory yeah yeah that's right i um 
I like when I first started as well. Like when I, I started off with taekwondo, um, and then I started like obviously playing around with jujitsu and stuff. Um, and then I was always just like the first thing I practiced in jujitsu was guard. Can like everything was off my back. <laughs> I constantly, I constantly um, just fought off my back, uh, and I would get smashed like all the time. Then obviously I started getting a bit of success off my back, and that was it. And I just worked. I was using a lot of rubber guard and stuff, and like sort of using a clinch game that I could use for. Um, MMA like without getting elbowed in the face without getting punched in the face um, yeah. and I kind of like the problem with, and then what happened was I started fighting M- MMA but I relied um, on my guard too much um, mm-hmm. it worked like the f- first four or five fights I won them all um, and then it going into like my sixth fight I just basically got held on my back the full fight and I couldn't sub the guy and I, and I got beat on points and I was like shit right I need to start uh, working more like wrestling obviously as that this was ten years ago, like nine, ten years ago, back back when I first started fighting MMA. So it was, um, it wasn't as advanced as what it is now. Obviously, like yeah. uh, that skill set, I wouldn't have been winning any fights. Never mind my first four or five. But um, so yeah, like, but just adapt, like, like you say, is like take um, what works in MMA. Um, like just even like old school basics, basically a strong uh, side control. A good uh, like your your arm bars, your triangles, your really good chokes. Like that, that's the kind of submissions you see in. Obviously, that's the most high percentage. Uh, uh, your guillotines as well in MMA. You know what I mean? So just sort of, well, that was. I mean, I would I would just say that was like you like to say or you said that you were on your back for a few times, right? Well, mm-hmm. that was a huge thing. Not that I had to train out of, but more realize that it's more beneficial to be on top than it is to be on the bottom especially in MMA where there are strikes and stuff like that in Jiu Jitsu mm. you can be very comfortable on your back yeah, that's you right. yeah. And, and you start fighting you know a guy who's a wrestler or a striker and you let him get on top yeah. you know at the end of the day you most likely will take some hits that's just how it is that's how yeah, it yeah. is yeah. you know everyone knows a little too much of, of everything so we definitely had, that was a big thing for me is, is I remember training with a wrestling coach as, as soon as I would take somebody down, if it didn't go my way, I was okay with laying on my back, which I, you know, I yeah, you just, yeah. still am, I'm still am okay with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We kind of had to train that out so that if I did take somebody down and, oh shoot, he swept me from the bottom, I had to scramble to get out because it was, you know, it's just not as beneficial to be on the bottom as it is on the top. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. hundred percent. I mean, it's like when I, anytime I'm now, if I get taken down, the first thing I like to do is just get back to my feet or sweep or submit. Yeah. If, if the sweep or submission isn't working, I'm just like to frame, get back to my feet, technical stand up basically, or get your back to the cage and work up. Um, it's not a place you want to hang out. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 That, that, I think that's the thing as well with the development of the sport because it has come along so far. People truly are well rounded these days. There, there is still specialists out there, but we're seeing um, a lot of guys, or even guys, guys that are wrestlers, developing their striking. And I think you need to be very well rounded and dangerous everywhere these days to reach the top. Uh, I think that's that's how far the sport sport has progressed now. And for you as well, Conrad, um, you're obviously early in your your professional career. So this, I would imagine, this is a stage where you're making big developments between fights when you're out of camp that's probably when you're, you're developing your most are you noticing that from fight to fight do you feel your game is improving fast every time I would say absolutely I would say the more experience I have in <clears> the cage <throat> it definitely helps um, you know not only with the learning process but it'll help in the long run for sure and my father uh, after I think it was after my fight in Israel when I won um, somebody asked my father, they were like, hey, wouldn't you want Conor to submit the guy in the first round? Wouldn't you want Conor to knock the guy out in the first round? My dad goes, no. He goes, of course I want my son to win. But he goes, the longer it takes for my son to beat somebody, it doesn't mean he's bad. It means he's getting experience in the cage. It means that, that he's putting in the time in the actual cage because you can train as much as you want in the gym privately with your guys, but it'll never, at the end of the day, it'll never give you that time in the real cage when it comes down yeah, to it, yeah. life or death. Yeah. <laughs> so I would definitely say that, that that time in the cage, even though I did, you know, submit uh, Oscar Vera with an armbar in the first round, that's besides the point. 
Um, <laughs> Uh, you're gonna take it. You're gonna take it. If yeah, it comes, look, but... <laughs> yeah. If it comes, it comes. Yeah, if it comes, you're it comes. But it absolutely, you know, I'm not. I'm not trying to prolong the fight. But if the fight does end up going those three rounds of five minutes, there's nothing wrong with that at all. You know. Yeah. 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 As as unique, the sport is unique in this way. We were speaking about about soccer. Sorry, I've got to have to football as we we like to call yeah. that soccer. Yeah, football. <laughs> <laughs> But those guys are playing every Saturday. They're playing in front of big crowds at the top level and they're playing for 90 minutes. Whereas the MMA fighters, if you're winning quickly each fight, I mean, you could be in your fifth fight and have maybe, say, six minutes cage time. It's it's not a lot of time. And as you say, you can't replicate it in there. So are you feeling yeah. as well, the more time you get in there, you just feel more comfortable and it becomes uh, that you get more used to that environment? Yeah, I mean, as much as much as people would like to replicate it, you just can't like I'll, when I'm preparing for a fight, I will go into my gym, go get a cage, go to my gym. We'll have, I'll have usually my very close friends, um, come, all my coaches will come and we'll turn the music, bring a stereo, turn the music up as loud as we can crank it as loud as we can. Mm -hmm. But I do that to be able to make sure I can still hear my coaches. And they're not going to be yelling at me. You know, they're not going to be, you know, screaming at me the whole time. But it's just talking like we're talking right now. Hey, Connery, mm -hmm. here's an arm bar. Go get it. Hey, Connery, move back. You know, adjust your feet. Hey, Connery, throw the jab more. But I do, mm -hmm. you know, I do training like this. But at the end of the day, like, like we're talking about, there's nothing like being under the heat of the lights, you know, with the whole crowd around you inside of a yeah. stadium. You can look, if you look behind your opponent, you know, you see all yeah, yeah, yeah. the people behind it. It's insane. It's crazy. And there's That's nothing. It's like when, when, you're, when, you're, when you're sparring with your training partners, your, your training partners aren't trying to kill you. You know, like when you're going into a fight, this guy is trying yeah, to kill yeah. you in front of everyone. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, you know, like everyone, like loads, everyone's watching all your, fr all your, your yeah. friends, your family, and, and you, you, this guy's coming in to choke the life at you. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah like, that, that, there's no messing about, you know what I mean? In, in the cage, obviously, when you're sparring in the gym, you're there with your teammates, you're hitting each other, and you're, you're, yeah. but it's more like sort of work a lot of sort of speed, light, fast movement, just like really get the feel for it. And, and obviously, like maybe three, four weeks out from the fight, you're up at a bit, you know what I mean? You're hitting each other, but it's not the same as, like you say, going in, like you've got your walkout music, you walk out, it's like, and it's even like when you're wrapping your hands in the changing room, like, I don't actually wrap my hands, but I used to wrap my hands. Um, even just that and that's when I would start really feel it felt real you know what I mean like when, when they start wrapping my hands in the back change rooms like shit this is go time now because I usually I don't wrap my hands when I'm sparring I don't wrap them but in the fight I would wrap and I was like shit like, this is real now here we go like, <laughs> like, it's just game time you know what I mean like when, when that cage door closes and it's like it's, it's me or him so you know I always, I always actually look to finish guys fast as well to be honest I always do like in the first shot, I, I look to look uh, like a lot of head and arm chokes, dash chokes, and neckties and stuff. Like a lot of guys will come up on an underhook from half guard or uh, side control. And then like that, as soon as I always just fish straight through that wizard, fish through right onto the necktie, you've got yeah, the uh, darses and uh, all, all that kind of stuff. I, I, I get quite a lot of success with that. Um, which, like you say, it does it. It, it can help you win like, in the first round. Um, but you can't substitute that cage time as well. I, like what I, I, I do like having a going the distance as well as long as I do get the win <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> the latter, the, yeah, that's, that's the difference maker isn't as long it? as I get the nod then I don't mind <laughs> and I think the other thing we, like when you're in there live as well if you get in tough positions and stuff like that it teaches you things about yourself as a fighter I know Cam you'll be able to speak on this because you've been in a pretty tough position in a, a fight in the past title fight in the past for the AFC when you get your arm broke um, yeah, what, what, what round was that in oh yeah that's it's not oh damn it's a beauty. <laughs> that was a, that was a battle round. scar right there. That was a proper battle scar. Fucking, that was like a metal plate, seven pins in it. Uh, that was the fourth round. That was the fourth round at high altitude in Johannesburg. It's fucking torture. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this guy. I, I couldn't let I couldn't let him know that it was broken. Or they kept smashed even more. But even when I went back to my corner, Stevie McIntosh, who's like one of my my best friends, as well, he was in the corner. I, I couldn't tell him because if I told him, he would. I know Stevie would stop it, but. I still thought in my own head that like, I can still catch this guy. Like you know, I still thought I can win. Um, but by the end of the fifth round, I couldn't throw my right hand. My corner's screaming at me, "Let the right hand go! Let the right hand go! I fucking can't throw my right hand!" But I couldn't shout that back. Um, but I it's, sometimes, man, like sometimes you've just got to when like, fighting's all good and well when you're winning and like when you're when you're 
on top and you're, you know, you're the one pushing the pace. But it's like when you actually start properly getting beat up in a fight, uh, and it's, it's not so fun, you know what I mean? You're, you're not landing your shots. All of a sudden, your game plan's not working. Uh, and and there's, like, you've tried your plan B, you can't get them down or whatever, and you're getting beat up on the feet. This guy's a good boxer and uh, good angles and good wrestling and stuff. And it's, like, and it's, it's tough. I've had to, I've had to do, I had to do my first fight uh, for EFC against Boyd Allen. It was a fucking hard fight. I came out of that fight, the face busted up. Um, still went the distance, right? It was a good, it was a, it was a good fight. The first round was like, pretty close. Uh, but I picked up an injury in that fight early on, um, and I still just had to tough it out, man. It, was, it's, it wasn't fun. <laughs> like the first two rounds were okay. fun. Okay, but let me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Off a fight like that, okay, do mm-hmm. you ever review the tape to see what you did wrong? Yeah, 100%. I do, okay. actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 me too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what it's, I did. It, it's a cliche, this expression, but I've always <laughs> found it to be a true expression. It's win or learn. I know it's some, it is a cliche, but cliche, cliches become cliches for a reason because they are, they are true, generally. Um, yeah. And I guess yeah. that's any time you get losses, because mixed martial arts is a sport, to go undefeated is, I mean, it's almost impossible really, isn't it? Hard. Um, there's just so many variables that go into it. When yeah. you get a loss, I believe it's got to be the opportunity for you to grow as a, as a fighter. Um, I'd be interested to, we spoke about fighting in front of the crowd and stuff like that. We've seen some fights recently with no crowd. What, what would you feel about that, Conway, if you had to fight, fight in a big arena, no crowd? You would certainly hear your corner then. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, it wouldn't, it wouldn't really make a difference. I mean, I'm there to fight and I'm not there, you know, it's, how do I say? I'm not there to like, as much as I am there to please the crowd, I'm there more to fight Mm -hmm. and and to finish my opponent and to win. So, um, crowd or no crowd to me doesn't matter. I mean, it would, you know, it's better if there is a crowd, but if there isn't, that's fine. It'll be televised. Um, you know, not too worried about it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, what have you made of the events? If you if you've managed to catch any, and what have you thought about the the atmosphere and the the feel of the events? Do you think it feel obviously it feels different to a crowd? Um, has it been? Have you enjoyed it? If you've watched some of them. What do you mean? So what I mean is, if you've watched the UFC fights uh, with no crowd. Have you actually mm-hmm. quite enjoyed it? Uh, obviously, the, there isn't a crowd atmosphere there, but we get to hear the impacts of strikes. Um, do you think? I it's mean, been- yes and no. I think the crowd is what drives most fights. Mm-hmm. You know, I think the crowd is definitely. If you're not cool in the cage, the crowd definitely affects how you fight. And that's, that's, you know, they can boo you all they want as long as you keep a cool head and, you know, keep focus on your game plan. It shouldn't affect you. But that doesn't happen in most cases. So I think the crowd definitely has some effect on some fights. Um, you know, if there is no crowd, like I said, you stick to your game plan, you listen to your coaches and go out and try to get the win. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And. And another thing I wanted to um, ask you about is obviously who your father is and uh, you having the Gracie name. Uh, how do you do Because there, there has to be some sort of pressure that comes with that, whether it affects you in a good way or bad way. Um, obviously, I don't know. But h- how do you deal with that? Because there must be some expectations of you and, and some pressure of you coming coming from uh, that family and, and what, what's been achieved in the sport of mixed martial arts and Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Is that something you can put to one side and just focus on your performance or do you feed off I mean, I would say I'm just, I'm just here to fight. And, and, you know, my father always told me, you know, as long as you stepped in the cage once, you know, you you did your duty to this family and, and you did your family proud, win or lose, doesn't matter. You know, um, now not every great she steps in the cage. And I get that. And there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of them go to the teaching side of it. And, and, you know, I love teaching, honestly, a little bit more than I do training for fights. But, um, you know, that's just, that's just kind of how we are. We're teachers by nature. And we like to help people and, and you know, spread jiu-jitsu as much as we can, whether that is through the teaching or the fighting, um, you know. Yeah, and, and with regards to the teaching itself, I've spoke to a lot of coaches in the past and I've always told the active fighters that coach as well, they've always told me that they, they, they get a lot out of their coaching. 
um, actually helps him as a mixed mm-hmm. martial artist as well. Do you find that's that when you're, when you're coaching? Yes, that's, that's absolutely true, 100% true. Because I don't have to be in the gym doing, let's say, a hip throw 100 times. I could be in the gym, do it 25 times, and go teach the hip throw at night at my night classes, which I have you know, four or five classes a night, jiu-jitsu classes a night for about anywhere between 45 minutes to an hour each. You know? And I could teach that hip throw in those classes, and I'll do it so many times on the students, so many times mm-hmm. repetition that I end up doing that, what I would have done just for training alone. I end up doing that in my whole, you know, night or day or afternoon or whatever, you know? So, um, I definitely think that, that, you know, teaching yeah. definitely helps you for sure. The, the, other, the other thing I've heard people say, and you, you'll be able to maybe confirm this as well, is sometimes a lot of coaches, uh, when they're teaching students, they're, they're going over fundamentals and stuff like that again. And it just reaffirms to you how important the fundamentals are. Would you, is that an accurate statement? I would say so. I mean, I grew up on a lot of fundamentals, a lot of doing the same basic arm bar from the mount over and over and over. And I'll, for instance, we practiced, okay, in my last fight against Oscar Vera in Connecticut, we practiced that arm bar from the bottom more times than I can probably count, okay? So I would definitely say that, and that's the basic arm bar from the guard swing your leg up the other leg climbs you know grab the leg squeeze hips up is basic basic yeah and i would say i practice that more times than i can count for this last fight and at the end of the day it works in your environment that's smart fighting and now he's in a good position in the guard of connery gracie connery one and one going for the arm bar mike it's in there can he get it right it is all over First round submission victory for Connery Gracie. Here you see Connery taking his leg, bringing up high, controlling that head position, and sliding his legs over. Now he's got that arm deep. He's putting a lot of pressure on that elbow. The hips are engaged on that. That is a tight arm bar. That is painful, and that's why Oscar Vera had no choice other than to tap. His arm is getting torqued backwards, hyperextended. There's a lot of pressure right there. Nice submission win. It's almost like we put that, that, that many reps into a, a specific move. When you're in the fight and you fall into a situation where you can apply the move, it's almost just happening without you thinking then. It's just muscle memory kicks in. And oh, yeah. yeah. It's just how fast the hips will go as well. As soon as you see that, and your hips go bam, it's latched on. It's like, it's you know, when you get guys that are that good at that, like uh, one of my old training partners, Mott, but he, he used to have so much success with that. Just his, his hips were so fast. You know, as soon as that, as soon as he caught your arm, the centre of the, the chest line, bang, it was gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he would actually mind yeah. it. He caught, he caught that Yassine Bell Hadge with it. Uh, big French lad. And he was, he was <laughs> fought in a, uh, an MMA fight. A uh, big French lad. And he was, he got on top. He was ground and pounding him. And, and he just landed this submission out of nowhere. And just like this uh, arm bar from guard. And the, the lad was that big. He actually picked him up and slammed him. But as he slammed him, yeah. he actually made the arm bar tighter as well. And he, he still yep. wouldn't tap this guy. And he actually uh, mop put the wrist underneath his armpit and really levered it hit under the armpit. As well. <laughs> and this guy snapped, he snapped the arm, he popped it. The guy was just devastated to get beat, but it was it was such a, a good submission that. But he's deadly at that. He was really, really good at that submission. Just used to smash it all the time. And I actually got my defence a lot better because he roamed all, all the time. If, if he wasn't uh, armbarring you from guard, then there, was, there wasn't many people at the time. Yeah. yeah. And when we're... Um Tony, when you're uh, preparing your training between fights, obviously out with uh, the global pandemic, how do you break your training up in terms of your Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu wrestling? What's that, that schedule like for you, breaking everything up? I mean, as of right now, um, you know, training is at a very minimum just because of what's going on. Yeah. Um, a lot of the gyms are still closed, especially here in California. We're, we're kind of one of the slower states to reopen um, a lot is still closed. So like I, you know, we talked about this a little earlier. Um, yeah. I bring my strength and conditioning coach here to my house. Uh, he's been in my family for a long time. He was my dad's strength and conditioning coach. Um, great guy. I love him to death. He's like an uncle to me. 
Um, so I bring him here to the house. We do my strength and conditioning here at the house. I have weights. I have my dad, obviously, uh, is in the house with me. So we have mats here. We just roll off the mats real quick from Fuji. So um, uh, we do that. And then, yeah, I have one more striking coach who I bring in also. And, and with regards to, um, obviously, I know you can't, is there other people you would normally train with who you don't have access to at the moment? There are. Uh, I usually have, on top of a like a stand-up coach for MMA, I do have a boxing coach because I love like to learn the, I'm, you know, born in fundamentals. So I love to learn the fundamentals of not only jiu-jitsu, but a lot of other martial arts. So I do have a boxing coach because, we focus a lot on speed and technique, a lot on footwork, a lot on how my wrist turns to throw the punch, you know, it's, and it's a lot of repetition over and over. You can never get enough of it. Um, I would also say I bring him in. So I bring a boxing coach in. I do have a wrestling coach, Kenny Johnson. He's a great guy, great coach. Um, I bring him in, or we train over at Black House MMA, but Black House right now is closed because it's such a large gym. So uh, I haven't been there in a few months, honestly. Um, but yeah, I think those two are the ones that I, I usually bring in. And then I have a, another jiu-jitsu coach who's a black belt under my father who lives, you know, half an hour from me. So we meet up in the middle. We have a gym, lo- local gym around here uh, that we can train at. Yeah. Uh, black, black so yeah, I bring those three in. Black house isn't a, a bad place to be. Trade that either. There's, no. a, there's a few killers no. in those mats for sure. Is that in LA? Yeah. Is that in LA? Black House. Black House is in uh yeah outside LA. It's, a, yeah, it's, it's LA, like half, LA. half an hour for me. Yeah. Is that that's wait no, make sure I'm not getting mixed up. Half El Cordeo. What? Is that Half El Cordeo in Black House? No, no. Black oh. House is um uh who are the guys? It's a uh, Kenny Johns. There's a lot of Kenny Johnson. Um, that's right. Kevin Casey, uh, yeah. Shaman Moraes, just fights the UFC, Anderson Silva, Leoto Machida. We all train out of like the same, yeah. We're all in the same gym. A lot. There's a ton of guys, a bunch of girls too fight, you know. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a couple of good guys right there to, uh, to get some fight <laughs> yeah. in the street. Yeah. Uh, um, that's a pretty good lineup. <laughs> yeah, they've they, they done not too bad over their career. They were, they were pretty good, those guys. Yeah, 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 pretty good. And that's the other thing as well is what I was watching. I was watching your fights, um, and then I, you look over at the corner, and I'm like, Jesus, that is a that is a pretty good corner to have. It's not it's not a bad corner team you've got there. That's a that's a wealthy experience over there. How, how good yeah, is it for uh, you? You in a fight what? as well? How good is it for you that you're you're in the fight and you know you've got that wisdom and experience in the corner? Wait, okay. You want to know something crazy? My yeah. dad. My dad maybe says one word the whole fight. Maybe <laughs> one word. I think, he, I think he trusts me enough and knows that we've gone through all of the hard parts already that once I get in the cage, that he doesn't really need to speak unless he act, absolutely has to, you know? Um, I think that he just trusts it and trusts the process and trusts that... I know what I'm doing and I've been taught by my coaches well enough to go in there and do, you know, what we have strategized to do. Uh, but yeah, I mean, for instance, my first fight was Rodrigo Gracie, Hoist Gracie, and then my stand-up coach. And then my second fight was Hoist Gracie, my dad, Henzo Gracie, and my stand-up coach again. And then third fight was my stand-up coach, Henzo and Hoist again, yeah. actually. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd really like them to make up Henzo. I'm sure that would be... <laughs> I just like hearing Henzo speak, it's brilliant. I, oh, man, I love being around Chiu Henzo. He's great. <laughs> man, so. just, like, um, I've got to go back here. Um, let me remember this story correctly. It was, it was hilarious at the time, I believe. Did, it, did Henzo not uh, film or like, like an Instagram-type story thing? I don't know if it was Instagram. Um, where someone tried to mug him or something like that, if I'm remembering this story mm. correctly. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, uh, that was that was that was probably one of the funniest things I've ever seen, and it, it uh, just get that, that I'm, personality. I'm assuming, I'm assuming this was back in Brazil, right? Oh yeah, this was a while, this was a while ago. Yeah, okay, uh, okay. Yeah. It was basically filming <laughs> yeah. while he beat the guy up. I mean, the guy deserved one hundred percent, but they have one hand filming and the other hand beating the guy up. Will be pretty funny for him. 
that he, sounds like something he would do. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's such he's such a character. Um, I really oh, I love him with the UFC on filtered by Matt Sarah and stuff like that. It's brilliant. Uh, yeah. So that's uh, yeah, that's that's a pretty pretty good corner team you have, and I'm sure for some of the guys coming in fighting as well, looking across the cage, looking obviously you're in there to fight them, and then seeing the experience you've got behind you as well, I'm sure that could be daunting for some fighters too. Yes, um, but I would say, you know, that once you step in that cage, as much as you listen to your coaches and you hear everything that's going on, um, a lot of it is just instinct. Instinct takes over, and, and as much as you want to, like, think about, oh, my gosh, he has all these crazy legs behind him, that's mm. not what's going through your head in the middle of the fight, in the, you know, arena, in the cage. Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, it's different from training. When he's training, he's probably stressing himself out. But when you get into the fight, I don't – because I don't think about his coaches. Why would you think about mine, you know? Mm. Even though mine are, you know, Gracie's and stuff like that, I don't think it really – like in the heat of the moment, I don't think that that would affect – anything mm-hmm. yeah. if anything it would be more of a subconscious thing that's in his head but i don't think that would be the first thing going through his thoughts no yeah the, the other thing i was thinking about as well is obviously <coughs> um, having that crazy name it's you've got all that experience with your father and your uncle stuff like that but guys that are fighting are probably going to, you're going to have a wee bit of a target in your back would you say that's fair to say because mm-hmm. guys are going to, go, going to go in there and fight you 100 so i guess yeah. that, that's the other side of it as well I mean, if they want to fight, let's fight. <laughs> it's not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> <Set it up. laughs> That's and, it. Uh, perfect. Um, and the other thing, like, I was interested about your training as well. Um, obviously, fighting MMA. You have said you're not really com- you're not competing BJJ. That's not something you're looking to do. You're focusing on MMA. Yeah. Is, that, is that still uh, still standing yeah, that's, that's that's correct. Yeah. And um, when you're leading up to a fight, how how do you do your uh, do your Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, are you training in the gi and no gi, or do you focus more no gi leading up to your fight? What, or do you always stay in the gi? What's your sort of process? I would say about a, anything before, like anything before a month out, I'm probably still in a gi. Rare, like still rarely training without a gi. Um, I would only train without a gi if it's for stand-up or MMA-based stuff wrestling a stand-up anything like that if it's ju- just jujitsu alone i'm most likely i'm still gonna stay in a gi um i can stay in a gi and i'll be like hey look i'll you know tell my coaches hey look uh tonight don't grab the gi just you know grab the wrist grab the neck instead you know it's just you know train mma but i'm still in a gi um i would say then that month before about a month to a month and a half before i'll start transitioning my my jiu-jitsu you know, uh, I'll honestly cut down classes, like teaching classes about a month before, month and a half before. I'll cut down teaching and I'll focus solely on my training myself. Um, uh, my training will become more private, more secretive. Yeah. Um, what I do will be behind a lot of closed doors type of stuff. Um, you know, no filming, of course. Like we, we have a lot of rules like when it comes down to it. Because any <coughs> little... Any little advantage that you give to your opponent is something that he can use against you. So we're pretty strict when it comes to about a month and a half before. We cut a lot of stuff down. Yeah. Yeah. We were, uh, I, I remember uh, me and my mate, we were over training at 10th Planet Corona. We were over doing a yeah. bit of training yeah. there. And we went down to Kron's. Uh, he had his first MMA fight coming up. It was his first, he went straight in at Pro anyway, didn't he? So it was his first fight. And uh, we wanted to go. And we just wanted to go do a bit of training anyway. So we went down, but it was just unfortunate. He literally was three weeks out from his fight or something like that. So yeah. he said, like you're saying right now, he says, look, this is basically closed door sessions. I don't just saying like I don't want you to see the way I train for a fight, sort of thing. Like yeah. just you know, well, what I mean? it has it has nothing to do with people personally. Like it has nothing to do with you personally. It's just yeah, the yeah, no, fact. I, I it's that. just. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just the fact that the people that are going to be in that room are coaches and mm-hmm. people that I trust with my life. Yeah. People that will not film my best friends that are around me day in and day out. You know, the people that have my back are those people that will be in that room. 
Yeah. It's not that it, you know, like, like I said, it's not that it's anything personal to anybody. You know, a lot of people ask me, Hey, can I come watch? And I, I have to turn a lot of people down because unfortunately at the end of the day, it's not, I mean, it has a little to do with trust, but it's like, look, if I let you in this room, how do I know you're not going to go yeah, and brag exactly. to your friends? Hey, I was in this room with Connery Gracie, man. He was, yeah. he was training for a fight and he was throwing a lot of leg kicks. And yeah. how do you know that friend of yours, this MMA community is small. How do you know that friend of yours is not friends with your opponent who might be fighting you? Yeah, you yeah. know. So it's just, it's this whole thing. And, and we love to keep a very closed training when it comes about a month to a month and a half out from the fight mm -hmm. a month out from the fight yeah yeah i mean we, we spoke earlier about the small margins in mma so the whole point <coughs> of training and leading up to a fight is to optimize yeah. your chances of winning and you, absolutely if, if you're developing new things or you've got a specific game plan uh probably best to bring that out in the fight rather than let somebody know beforehand mm -hmm. um, definitely so yeah, um but we're all sort of like, like we say, you, you, you can't train properly at the moment. You're kind of you're doing what you can. Um, yeah. Is it just just a case you, you just need to wait for Bellator to make the call? Have you got a, a a timeline you're hoping you can get back in there? I mean, I'm hoping I can get on the first card that they come out with. But um, as of right now, like I said, I don't know exactly what's going on. Yeah. Um, you know, but as soon as they you know tell me that they got a card, I'm <laughs> I'm trying to jump. On it, yeah. It's, <laughs> I, <wanna> fight. <laughs> I think I think there's good opportunities, especially for fighters based out in the states at the moment. Because with Bellator being a, a an American promotion, I think the European guys are going to have to wait a wee bit longer. But I think we're all the same. We just still want to get fights back. And uh, I don't know, don't know how you are, Callum, because you obviously you went in and fought in the Dublin card in Bellator and got quite an impressive victory. And, um, what, what's the word with Bellator at the moment? Are you still waiting for the call? Uh, I think, I think everyone's just kind of on the same boat at the moment, um, just waiting on it. I mean, I heard October. I heard October. Um, yeah, I heard end, end of the year, so we'll see. Yeah, I don't know. I but not, don't. Not, like I said, not, nothing's finalized. They have no dates in the book, you know, as of right now that I know of. Um, so we're all just waiting. It's all hearsay, I think, at the moment. It's yeah. all hearsay. Yeah. It's, no, no one really knows. So you just got to just <laughs> yeah, wait and see. So it's, it's crazy. So obviously, as we were talking about earlier, Conrad's got his father to train with, and you've uh, how? What's the situation with the uh, with what? Did you call Bob? Was it Bob you had out the back who you were beating up, Cal? <laughs> I've got like Bob a, the dummy, I've got a dummy, I've got a dummy, a dummy in the back garden. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I, just go and, I go and beat him up. <laughs> so, but, he, so he, he's out the back garden with my dummy's ass. It's, but it's better I, than nothing. I, it's, it's getting yeah. you some training in. I don't know. Um, it, 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 yeah. Oh wait, here we go. Yeah, so so the, 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 beating up. Well, uh, le at least you've been doing something and keeping yourself busy. Yeah. Um, so listen, we won't, won't keep you on uh, much longer. Uh, obviously, Conry, thanks very much for for jumping on the call and, and coming in and having no, a chat with us. It's, it's you always guys a me. pleasure. Good no, we appreciate it, mate. Again, thanks very much for coming on the Higher Level Podcast and uh, we look forward to seeing you in your next fight. Thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. Thank you, mate. Cool. See you later, guys. Bye. Cheers.